Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Please get cozy as we jump right into these Bigfoot and paranormal encounters. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe and ding that notification bell. I post new videos every single day and you'll be notified when they go live. Okay, let's get into it. The journey through these puzzling occurrences traverses time beginning in the 1960s, etching memories onto the canvas of my life in the northern panhandle of West Virginia. Shadows of unexplained sightings cloaked my childhood home, whispering tales of mysteries intertwined with family routines and the humble homestead. In hushed tones, these clues lingered, forming a silent tapestry of enigma that stretched across the years confined to the inner circle of our small family unit. A crescendo of whispers transformed into a symphony of undeniable presence, gradually revealing a presence beyond the familiar rhythms of raising a family and tending to a modest homestead. A mysterious thread wove itself through the very fabric of our lives, a thread that weaved through the dirt road, the vast land, and the very air we breathed. It all began on a warm autumn day in 1967, against the backdrop of a serene cow field. This field, nestled behind our family's abode, held within it a small home, a cluster of outbuildings, a sprawling garden, and a little over six acres of cherished land. Adjacent to our property, a neighboring farmer's field stood divided from ours by barbed wire fencing. The landscape unfolded like a portrait, a steep hillside adorned with tall grasses, adorned by a veil of wood. This is where the first story unfurled, a story woven with innocence and astonishment. The protagonist of this tale was my sister a mere nine years old at the time, and our father. Together they ventured into the heart of the hillside woods, their eyes drawn skyward by a spectacle that defied explanation. High amidst the treetops, they beheld a sight, both baffling and extraordinary. Creatures that swung with an uncanny agility, traversing the branches with swift grace. My sister painted a vivid tableau, with her words, describing these enigmatic beings as baby orangutans adorned with stringy orangish hair and limbs that moved with almost ethereal fluidity. Upon their return, our home buzzed with excitement, fueled by the tale of the monkeys gracing the West Virginian landscape. Theories tumbled forth like leaves in the wind. Perhaps a wandering circus had misplaced its troop. Or maybe our well-heeled neighbor harbored a penchant for pet monkeys. Yet with the passage of days, each theory waned, revealing a puzzle that resisted an easy solution. The tale of the mysterious monkeys slowly faded, leaving us with a sense of wonder that lingered like an echo. Time flowed onward, carrying with it further enigmatic encounters that added to the tapestry of inexplicability. A mile down the same road at my grandparents' home, a series of unsettling incidents unfurled. Amidst the shadows of grief following my grandfather's passing, my grandmother and aunt found themselves face to face with an eerie presence. Peering through the kitchen window, they beheld a face that defied reason, a face that gazed back at them from an elevated vantage point, as if borne aloft by an unseen force. The window, elevated from the ground, presented an enigma that lingered in their thoughts, a mystery whose implications echoed like a whisper in the wind. In the midst of these riddles, a neighbor's voice added a new dimension to the unfolding narrative. His tale unfolded in the shroud of darkness, a nocturnal encounter with a bear that he described with unwavering conviction. Yet skepticism permeated the air. Our parents raised eyebrows, casting doubt upon the veracity of the tale. 
As the years spun their thread, this particular mystery dissolved, leaving only fragments of a tale that had seemingly lost its way. Dogs, our loyal companions, became unwitting participants in this unfolding enigma. My father, a seasoned hunter, kept a retinue of hounds that patrolled the night with vigilant barks and fervent energy. Yet these canine sentinels would often find themselves stirred up to uproar by an unseen presence in the neighboring cowfield. Nocturnal admonishments were a routine occurrence, a ritual my father undertook to quell the restless baying that echoed throughout the night. The tapestry of these unexplained events wove its threads into my adolescent ears, remaining a silent enigma that shaped the landscape of my memory. By the time my 15th birthday had come and gone, the landscape had transformed and my steps were guided by a newfound independence. Alone or with friends, I traversed the fields and woods, tracing shortcuts etched into my memory from years past. One such shortcut led me to a towering tree adorned with a rope swing, a hidden gem nestled amidst the landscape. The sun-dappled days of summer unfolded beneath the shade of its branches, as my friends and I reveled in its simple pleasures. The swing became a cherished escape, a place where laughter intermingled with the rustle of leaves. Yet, an unforeseen encounter shattered this idyllic facade, revealing an undercurrent of disquiet that lurked in the shadows. As I sat upon a rock, my brother-in-law's ascent to the rope swing was accompanied by an eerie soundtrack the sound of a woman's scream echoing through the landscape. A chill ran down my spine as the second scream joined the first, reverberating through the hollow like a haunting refrain. An instinctual urge surged within me, propelling me away from that place of innocence and into the realm of uncertainty. Years rolled by, ushering in new chapters and revelations that added layers to the tapestry of Enigma. A son's unsettling discovery of deer carcasses, a family dog's nocturnal symphony of barks, and the chorus of yells and vocalizations that punctuated the night painted a tableau of unease. Time stretched its fingers further, casting its veil upon my nephew's experiences in the very heart of the land that had birthed these mysteries a pine tree swaying with unnatural intensity, and the specter of a massive entity disturbing the woods evoked a sense of otherworldly presence that defied rational explanation. Amidst these whispered tales of the uncanny, my family and I would gather, sharing stories that intertwined across decades and generations. Voices would rise and fall, weaving a collective tapestry of experiences that merged the ordinary and the inexplicable. As I trace back these threads of the unknown, I am reminded of the profound nature of the land that nurtured my childhood and witnessed my journey into adulthood. Each encounter, every enigma, forms the mosaic of the extraordinary lurking beneath the veneer of the familiar. And so, the tapestry of these unexplained mysteries remains a testament to the boundless enigma of the world we inhabit, a world where the ordinary and extraordinary coexist in a dance of intrigue and wonder. On to the next one. It was 2008, and my uncle and I had planned a hiking trip for a while. Well, the day arrived and we set out. The day was miserable weather-wise, leaving us soaked to the bone. Other than the non-stop rain, there was nothing unusual about the hike up until the last leg. We were on a dirt trail heading uphill with bushes and trees either side. We were marching onward in silence at this point when all of a sudden there was a rustling in the foliage to our left. From behind a large bush stepped an old man in a black suit 
with a red bow tie and dress shoes. He looked late 70s, early 80s, very pale, liver spots dotting his face, and a gray and white comb over. I was instantly weirded out. Who dresses like that to go into the woods? The instant thought that seeing a guy his age out there in those clothes, in those weather conditions, was this guy has lost his marbles. There was something else that took me an extra moment to notice, though, that puzzled me. The guy was bone dry, didn't even have mud on his shoes. We stopped in our tracks and just stared at the man for a moment, who appeared to be as frozen and shocked at seeing us. My uncle made the first move, taking a step towards him, asking him if he was all right. The old man continued to stare for a moment, not moving even a twitch, then became suddenly very animated. It was like he suddenly snapped out of a trance. He started flailing his arms wildly, saying something awful had happened, that a good friend of his needed help. He began walking backwards into the woods, motioning for us to follow him, which we did. We started off at a brisk walk, then escalated to running as we struggled to keep up with the old man. After maybe a minute, he disappeared ahead of us, but we could hear him so continued to follow the noise until we reached a huge slope. We stopped at the edge and looked down to see the old man standing at the bottom motioning us, pleading with us to follow him. I remember looking down, and the slope was probably at a 40-degree angle, spanning for perhaps 50 feet or more, and slick with mud. It looked like an accident waiting to happen, especially given there were no shrubs or roots to hold on to or anything. I remember looking down at that old man on the other side of the slope and wondering, how the heck did he cross that so quickly and cleanly? I mean, at that distance, it is hard to see fine details clearly, but I swear he still did not appear to be wet or muddy at all. Me and my uncle looked at each other, and I saw that he was getting as weirded out as I was. Despite my feelings, I made a step toward the edge and was going to try to make my way down when my uncle grabbed me firmly by the arm and pulled me back. Under his breath, he said to me, something's wrong here. We took a few steps back from the edge at this point, and the old man at the bottom started getting irate. He began pleading with us again to come down the slope, telling us he needed our help. His friend was in trouble. My uncle shouted to the old man that we would head back to our car and call emergency services for him, that professional help would be on its way soon. Then they would have all the tools to help him. The old man suddenly got furious. He began jumping up and down, demanding that we come down the slope right now or there would be heck to pay. His voice had changed drastically. He was practically growling his words. His hands bunched up into fists, pounding his knees like an angry toddler throwing a tantrum. I have never seen a grown adult fly into such a rage in my life. His eyes looked like they were on the verge of bursting out of their sockets. His skin, gone from a pale to red in almost an instant. We began to hurriedly make our way back the way we had come, his demands and threats getting less audible as we got closer to the trail. Once on the trail, we practically power marched the remaining quarter mile or so to the car, all the while my uncle was on the phone to the emergency services, explaining to them that there was a possible mentally ill old man wandering the trail. We were ordered to get to our car and wait the police so we could show them where we had encountered him. About an hour later, we met four officers, two of whom had dogs with them, and packs of supplies like first aid, emergency blankets, and the like. We led them to the exact spot and then pointed the two officers with the dogs in the direction. He led us through the bushes. The search lasted all weekend, but there was no trace of the old man. Officers said the only trail they could pick up had been mine and my uncle's. They didn't find any footprints or anything belonging to the old man we encountered. 
one of my weirdest experiences to date. On to the next one. After my parents' divorce in 2017, my mother returned to her hometown in the countryside of Japan, where I started spending my summers and school breaks. I'm half Japanese, and though I'd never been to my mother's home country before she moved back, she exposed me to Japanese culture from a young age. She'd share old Japanese folktales and talk of the wandering spirits, and most of the time, we'd eat our dinner on the floor. Dinner was always authentic Japanese cooking. Luckily, there was an Asian supermarket the town over from us, so I was aware of the Japanese culture's ties with the spiritual realm. Little did I know I'd experienced it during my first trip. Summer 2017 is when I first flew into Japan, just months after she made the move. The village in which she resided consisted of humble rice farmers and forests. One afternoon, I asked if there were any trails that I could hike in the woods nearby. Yes, but do not stray from the path no matter what, Mom told me. And be back in two hours so I know you're okay. I brushed off her comment, for I considered my mother an overly superstitious person at the time, and it was something I was used to. However, I agreed to return in two hours for her closure. The trail led through a field into the forest behind my mother's house, which was utterly beautiful. What looked like pink grass was growing everywhere, and the hot summer sun was beating down on me, making me look forward to entering the shaded forest. Soon as I emerged into the tree line, there was a drastic temperature change, too extreme for me to credit with the leaves for blocking the sun. Weird, I said aloud, the sweat on my body almost drying off instantly. The forest was dark and quiet. I heard more birds chirping in the field than among the trees. The trail winded on flat ground for a while before continuing up the mountainside. The further I walked on the path, the colder I got, and before reaching the path's incline, I started focusing on my breathing pattern to prevent myself from shivering. It was that cold. Soon, as I trekked uphill, I heard a voice in the distance. It sounded like fellow hikers having a conversation, but as I kept walking, the voices neither got louder nor quieter. Their volume stayed consistent. Before long, I heard more voices, whispers, speaking Japanese. I wasn't fluid, but I could make out one voice, seemingly a woman's, asking, you know where you are? The question sent goosebumps throughout my body. As directed by my mother, I ignored it, and stayed on the narrow trail with my head forward. Eventually, it got darker, so dark that I had to pull out my phone's flashlight to see ahead. I didn't understand how the trees could block the hot midday sun to an extreme extent, and something about it was unsettling. Creeped out and no longer enjoying my hike, I turned around and started walking back to the open field and my mother's house. I felt silly ending my walk so soon out of fear and was embarrassed to face my mom after only being gone for less than half an hour. But once I left the coldness of the trees and entered the clearing, I realized I had been gone for much longer. It wasn't that the forest was abnormally dark. It was nighttime. The open field was just as dark as the woods, but dim light cast from lantern were moving and scattering about with people calling my name, something I couldn't hear before stepping out of the forest. I'm here, I yelled out. Then one lantern started darting toward me. My mother was holding it, greeting me with a tight hug. What did I say about two hours? She scolded me. Mom, I thought I was only gone for 20 minutes, I promise. You didn't notice it getting dark? The forest was dark as soon as I entered it. I didn't notice it was nighttime until now. My mother and the neighbors escorted me back to her home to perform a blessing, cleansing me of any energy that could have followed me from the woods. After that, she made it very clear that she forbid me from stepping into the forest again or any Japanese forest without her. 
She blames spirit for my loss of time, but a question remains. What happened to me? When I lost so many hours of awareness, what was I doing? The forest was dark as soon as I entered it. Did I lose my mindfulness instantly? And if so, how would that be possible? I couldn't rack my brain around the idea of hours passing in mere seconds. It took me to cross over from the field. I can see the forest from my bedroom window in Japan. It haunts me from afar, calling my name persistently, begging me to cross its borders again. To this day, I have never experienced nor heard of an experience that creeps me out more than this one. On to the next one. I am very excited to announce that on this channel we are offering membership. Now, I never want my subscribers to feel like I am paywalling content, so new videos will remain 100% completely free. The membership is a way for those who feel like they want to support me to do so and help the channel grow monetarily. What your membership gives you access though to are subscriber badges, which evolve with how long you've been a member, and you can watch your badge grow from a baby Bigfoot all the way up to a sage Bigfoot. Also, as a member, you'll get access to member-only emojis, which are these beautiful Bigfoot emojis. Again, I never want to paywall any content on this channel. I always want the content to be free because I love the community and I want you to enjoy your time here. But if you do wish to support me making this content, this membership is a way for you to do that. Thanks for listening and on to the next one. I was 12 years old, visiting my sister M and her family in Davie, Florida, with my cousin A, who was 15 at the time. One night, we were sleeping on a pull-out couch in the sitting room when we smelled something like a skunk, only worse. We asked my sister what it was. She said it was the skunk ape, and he comes around in the hottest summers. We didn't believe her, so we asked our friends, and they said it was real. One night, while we were sleeping, and we seen a huge shadow come across the picture window. Then it turned, looked at itself, and let out a blood-curdling scream that scared us half to death. Then it turned and walked to the side of the house, and we followed it by going to the side bathroom. There it squatted down to eat a wild watermelon. Then it went to the back of the house to a man-made lake, squatted down, and drank some water. A few nights later, the beast attacked a wild horse in its corral, but the horse got away by jumping over the corral and ran off into the pasture. The rancher came out and took a few shots at the beast, but it got away. When the horse came back in, it had fingerprints on its hind quarters, not scratches, but finger marks. A few nights later, the beast came back and killed a farmer's bull. The farmer took a few shots at the beast, but missed it. At the same time, my sister and her husband Jay were coming home from a night out and the sheriff and his deputy were on patrol. We jumped into Joe's car and followed the deputy when the beast stepped out of the darkness and was hit by the police car. The beast went down and when it got up, it looked into the police car and let out a blood-curdling yell. We were about 10 feet behind the deputy car when the beast hit the police car with both hands and the back of the car came off the ground. Then it limped off into the swamp. When the sheriff got there, the car looked like it had hit a utility pole. Just then, the farmer came over and told the sheriff that his prized bull was dead. This bull was huge, at least a ton with its head ripped off and thrown across the pasture. That's when they called in the state police with their horses and dogs and helicopters. They searched the swamp all night but found nothing. There are underground caverns in the swamps of the banks of the canal. It was 1 a.m. There were sensor floodlights on all the corners of the house. It was in the Everglades Swamp. On to the next one. In Palm Beach County, we were going to go camping in the woods. It was a wooded area with a canal along one side 
that had a dirt pile next to it from digging out the canal. The dirt was high and very steep, almost straight upward. We were setting up the tents, and I looked out into the open field that was about a hundred yards away, and I saw a very tall, I'm not sure what to call it, thing running across the field. It stopped for about 30 seconds and looked down toward us and then ran straight up the dirt pile very fast to the top, stopped and looked again and ran away. This thing had no problem at all running up it. It was very tall and had long arms about to its knees. It had long brown hair all over its body. It actually was very man-like, but definitely not human. I don't believe. There was about six of us setting up a campsite. We did not stay after seeing this. It was about 4 p.m. It was wooded with man-made canal and a large open area. On to the next one. At the south end of Cleveland Heights Golf Course, just west of Willow Avenue in Lakeland in Polk County, I still remember it clearly. It took place on the west side of Lakeland, Florida in Polk County. This took place about eight miles from the Saddle Creek area near Lake John, which is at the end of Willow and Redwood Avenue. The area at that time was significantly more rural than today, and there was wooded, swampy area nearby, the end of Cleveland Heights Golf Course. We were sitting outside, looking toward the northwest. The sun had just set. We heard wood being chopped or tapped just behind the house on the other side of the street. The sound was muffled, further away than the house. We stood up and looked to see if we could see anything behind the house when something that looked like a very large upright monkey crawled up one of the pine trees and jumped down what must have been 20 feet. There were two of us watching the sunset. It was twilight, enough to still see color. It was in a pine forest on the edge of a swamp area. On to the next one. Near Ocala in Lake County in Florida, I was about 15 at the time, traveling with my mom and two younger siblings, brother and sister, driving from Atlanta to Fort Myers to visit my grandparents, as we did every December. We stopped in Ocala National Forest. I don't remember the campground because we didn't get there until after nightfall, and I remember we went to Alexander Springs the next day, which was close by. Anyway, we drove through the campground and picked one of the last spots, several empty camp spaces away from the closest camper. The night was mild, certainly compared to North Georgia. And we all had sleeping bags, so we just pitched them on the sandy ground under the stars. My mom and my brother and sister were together near the road, but I wanted some space so I was about 10 to 15 feet away, closer to the end of the space. I wasn't afraid of the outdoors. I'd already been whitewater canoeing, spelunking, camping, hiking, and all that. I loved to hike, and catching snakes was a particular interest. Anyway, I loved being in the woods, and I knew that even bears are scared of humans, and I didn't think anything would bother us in the campsite, even if we were on the fringe for there were a dozen or so other campers around, particularly a small group about four or five campers away who were having a bit of a party. Anyway, it was late, probably around 10 p.m., and so we got in our sleeping bags and went to sleep. I dozed off for, I don't know, maybe an hour, and suddenly woke up. It was pitch black and very quiet, except for the footsteps. At first, I thought it was some big man walking through the palmetto. It was definitely bipedal, which is what threw me later. I figured someone was either drunk, looking for a place to pee, or lost. I remember cocking an eye to the tree and could see no light reflected from a flashlight. I remember thinking it odd how someone could navigate the woods in total darkness without a flashlight which is why I figured it was someone drunk out to relieve himself. After about 15 or 20 seconds, perhaps a dozen footsteps, crunch, 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 I realized it was coming into our campsite. I say it because now I could hear it breathing, 
and whatever it was, I realized it was not human. It sounded like something huge. I lay very still, listening. Suddenly, I heard it very close to my head, no more than a few feet away, and it sniffed very deeply several times as if it was checking me out. I was suddenly seized with terror, and I have never been afraid like that before. It was an odd reaction. The back of my mind was telling me it was probably just a bear, the only thing I could think of that would be that big, that it was simply looking for a picnic basket. I was wide awake and never have had those night terror dreams. I was fully conscious. I simply did not want to move. I must have flinched because whatever it was suddenly went silent. Although I could not hear it, I was certain that it was still there watching me. After what seemed like an extremely long time, it was only about 10 or 15 minutes, the regular noises of the wood started to come back, and I could hear small animals rustling about the dried palmetto leaves around the camp. I quickly got up and went over to wake my mom and told her that there was a bear in the camp. She grabbed a flashlight, but all we could see was a short ways into the woods around the camp. She laughed at me for being scared of nothing. Well, I went to the car, locked the doors, and lay down in the back seat. I had a hard time going back to sleep. At first light, we packed up and headed off for Alexander Spring. And that entire trip, my mother teased me about how I was so frightened by an armadillo. Yeah, an 800-pound armadillo. I didn't think to check for print. I did run and quickly snatch my sleeping bag where I'd left it. And I neither saw anything nor smelled anything. But I convinced myself that it was a bear for whatever reason. It had enormous lung capacity, but it always bothered me that it was obviously walking on two feet and it left without making a sound. It was the middle of the night, probably around midnight or just after. I had never even seen or heard of a Bigfoot or Swamp Ape at that time. It was in the Ocala National Forest. They used to film Tarzan movies in there. On to the next one. In Broward County in Florida, several individual witnesses, including one in a car, made several sightings of a seven-foot-tall hairy humanoid that year. It was covered in hair and was not a bear, and one of the witnesses had run into it with his car. The car was damaged, but the hairy humanoid escaped. There was also severe destruction of the undergrowth in the finding of giant footsteps, but the beast had gone. On to the next one. I had the most frightening experience of my life last summer as I took a vacation to visit an old army buddy who lived in Gallup, New Mexico. Jerry is a Navajo Native American and he had promised me for years to show me some things about secret ceremonies of his people that would blow my mind. We originally got talking about this because I was born on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, and I will never return to that horrible place, and since my parents are long gone, I have no connection there any longer, thank God. I had no connection to my Lakota Sioux people. Jerry and I had become friends from the first time we ever met, and we enjoyed comparing our people's customs and lifestyles. He had heard about the wretched conditions at Pine Ridge, and I think he felt sorry for me, although he never expressed it. I was so impressed with the way his people had progressed, and he told me their reservation was like 27,000 square miles, and I wanted basically to see how it might have been to be proud of your heritage instead of saddened. I also had a really strong desire to learn more about his people's most powerful and secretive witch, Yi Naldoshi also known as Skinwalker, where most non-Navajo people are never even given a remote chance to learn about their witch culture. But my being a blood brother, so to speak, Jerry and I had a very special bond that we had cemented over our years in the same army outfit. We had never spent much time discussing the innermost secrets of our tribal cultures. So a while back, we rented a place where we could relax 
do a little fishing and plenty of drinking beer, basically being ourselves for a change. We have this place up between Twin Lakes and a spot called Coyote Canyon. And after three days of target shooting and relaxing, a friend of Jerry stopped by. And when we had all had more beers than common sense would dictate, Jerry really blew me away. We were sitting in a circle in lounge type chairs when Jerry leaned forward toward his friend Ron and told him that I had always wanted to meet a skinwalker. His buddy just looked over at me and told me that now I could say I had met one. The look on my face must have been strange because both of them began laughing so hard. They almost fell out of their chairs. Well, I know I must have kept looking back and forth between the two of them for verification. Then Ronnie began to openly discuss what up until now I'd always half suspected. To be a kind of made-up rouse to impress and frighten strangers. I thought they were going to tell me that the skinwalker thing was all phony. I was even more surprised when after popping another cap and guzzling half another beer, Ronnie openly discussed a few of his first outings after he had, as he said, joined the E. I think I must have been sitting there transfixed as suddenly both these bozos started cracking up, laughing and pointing at me. That's the reason I dare print this now as neither of them seemed to hide the truth. Trying my best to return to some part of normalcy, I tried to appear as though Ron's transmission to become a full-fledged witch was a normal procedure. I could believe some of the deeds he confessed to as his sort of initiation. Even Jerry listened intently as though he had never heard all of these transition requirements before and judging from his reaction, it appeared that it was news to both of us. Ron explained that their Navajo Dene people were all aware that the Yi was the final and most powerful advancement in their search for ultimate power. This step he carefully explained, was certainly not desirable to any but a small fraction of their people because the terrible sacrifices which a person had to make were not worth it. Jerry had told me about a few of the horrible steps that one must make, but I thought perhaps he had been trying to make his people sound more powerful than mine by my medicine is more powerful than your tribe's medicine sort of challenge. Hearing Ron elaborate on his going all the way to the final plateau in their tribe's witchcraft level was impressive, but also quite intimidating. Suddenly, Ron stood up and left us to use the restroom while Jerry and I remained silently disseminating the amazing presentation we had just witnessed. Later, we all sat around and snacked over soft drinks, chips, and a few hot dogs while our brains cut through the beer-induced fog. And when we felt able, we decided to venture off into the small canyon that was directly behind this, the last rental shack on the property. The canyon we were entering was obscured from view by the sand hill just behind us. And had we not been sitting out a ways, I would not ever have noticed its entrance at all. Ron led the way, and I noticed that he and Jerry both had strapped on pistols that were worn high on their hips to make them almost unnoticeable. Ron must have noticed my looking because he turned to me with a smile while patting his holster and said, Snakes. And then he led us into a very narrow slot canyon. He obviously placed some significance in our coming here because I heard him tell Jerry that this was where he made his transition, which I assumed was his final phase to reach his status as a skinwalker. I hadn't a clue as to where we were going, but the trail dipped suddenly downward at a rakish angle, and I found myself watching my feet and hardly noticing the cliffs on both sides that towered so high above us that when I did look, I felt my butt pucker like it was trying to keep my body from soaring straight up like gravity no longer existed. I was bringing up the rear and could hear Ron's voice as he was relating stories of this canyon's history and Jerry was answering him. But as the path once again leveled out and I looked up once more, I couldn't see Ron. I could see Jerry about 10 feet ahead of me, but although I could hear his voice, I couldn't see Ron. Thinking he must have rounded a corner, 
I took several quick steps to catch up, and now I was alongside Jerry, and there was no corner, nor was there any Ron. I gasped out the word, asking where Ron was, and Jerry looked at me strangely as if I had gone blind, and then suddenly Ron was alongside once again. Before I could gather my senses to speak, Ron looked at me with a gaze that seemed to read my inner thoughts and said, sorry, but I'm still having trouble shifting in and out of dimension. No more was said about Ron's skinwalker powers, and although I felt compelled to ask questions about what I had or hadn't seen, I decided to not delve deeper into something I may later regret. The next few days were relaxing, but things just weren't the same for me. As we packed to go our separate ways, Jerry must have sensed my apprehension, and he said for me not to give any concern for his taking further interest in advancing into his tribe's ye culture, because it's just too much sacrifice to gain that level of power. I breathed a huge and audible sigh of relief, and Jerry must have sensed my change in demeanor, because he laughed and said he'd stay contented to be just a plain old Native American. We both shared a laugh and headed our separate ways. Jerry said he promised not to tell Ron the next time we planned to get together, but as an afterthought said we better not talk if any ravens fly by. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!